Welcome back to Bitchy History, the irreverent history podcast that has a whole new intro song for a whole new season. And we're back. During the break, I turned 33, started another semester at the university, and finished playing Horizon Zero Dawn for the second time, which was a truly great use of my time. To start off the show, I'd like to give a shout out to our two newest Patreon supporters, Kelly and Katrina, who are both supporters in our Bitch Slap category. It means so much that you've decided to support the show. My summer break was less of a break than even I anticipated, but it did give me some much-needed time to kind of think about the podcast and what direction I want to take it in. Recently on History TikTok, we've been talking a lot about staying in our lane as historians, and that gave me a chance to really assess what my lane is and how that applies to what I'm doing with this podcast. The original concept for this show, when I started planning it a couple of years ago, was for a show called American History 101, What You Missed in Class, which is a pretty self-explanatory title, really. But then I changed the name of the series to Bitchy History, and during season one, I consistently realized that the vibe of the show didn't always match up to the vibe of the name. And while teaching American History 101 is certainly in my lane, I mean, I get paid to do it at a university after all, I'm not sure it's enough my lane to make me comfortable doing it as a general podcast. So we're shifting things up a bit here on the show. The episodes of the show that have been my favorite, and honestly listeners' favorites as well, have been the How Did America Get Here episodes, or the episodes like The Witch Trials where I end up delving into some of my weird historical hyperfixations, like women's history and cultural history. And I feel like that fits the title of bitchy history a lot better than a basic chronological run-through of American history. So this show is going to be going through a bit of a transformation. I hope you'll all come along for the ride while we kind of organically find our space in the history podcasting genre. This second season will definitely be a bit different than the first one, especially since I'm freeing myself from the constraints of a chronological take on American history, which is going to allow me to really delve into the areas of history that I'm most passionate about. Look out for some episodes that may in fact cover things like the topic of my master's thesis, Star Trek. That said, today's episode was planned far in advance, and I still think it's a wildly important topic, so here we go. Let's talk about the history of vaccines in America. It was a long time ago, longer now than it seems, in a place that perhaps you've seen in your dreams, for the story that you are about to be told took place in the medical worlds of old. Now you've probably wondered where vaccines come from, and if you haven't, I'd say it's time you begun. So in case you haven't been watching the news lately, COVID-19 numbers are spiking again, with outbreaks centered around workplaces and schools especially. Because that's what happens when there's a pandemic and you put lots of people into small areas in close contact and then penalize them for not coming in when they're sick. Don't even get me started on the professors I work with who specifically tell students that they can't have an excused absence unless they have a doctor's note. (laughs) No, I tell my students to stay home and attend my class via Zoom if they have so much as a sniffle or a sore throat. The university doesn't give me health insurance and I am not paid enough to contract your plague, even if it isn't COVID. No thanks. But why are we even still having these spikes? Surely once we had a vaccine, the problem would be solved, right? Well, I don't have to be the one to tell you that people have been increasingly moronic about vaccines in our generation. From the crunchy, all-natural moms who only feed their kids organic snacks and think vaccines cause autism, to the conspiracy theorists who think that the COVID vaccine was the mark of the beast and would make you emit 5G signals and let Bill Gates spy on you, anti-vaxxers have become more and more common and more and more unhinged over the past few decades. I'm sure there's a sociological or psychological reason for that, likely tied to the increasing popularity of other nutty conspiracy theories like Flat Earthers, Who Shot JFK, and the fake moon landing folks. But while there's a lot to be said about the ridiculousness of conspiracy theories, I just want to spend some time today talking about the importance of vaccines in American history and the importance of the anti-vax movement. Immunization, inoculation, vaccination, there's a lot of names this practice has gone by and a very long history of it in America. In fact, the very first American immunization mandate was ordered by General George Washington. Smallpox was one of the most deadly diseases of the era and caused the highest death rates of any disease in the Continental Army. 
Now, smallpox inoculations were not new when Washington ordered all of the soldiers in the army to undergo inoculation via the variolation process. Colonial Boston had faced many smallpox outbreaks throughout the 1700s. During the 1721 outbreak in Boston, a West African man named Onesimus, who was enslaved by Reverend Cotton Mather, an influential Puritan minister who you might remember from previous discussions of the Salem Witch Trials, he taught Mathers about the process of inoculation. Mather then convinced Dr. Zabdiel Boyston, a Boston medical doctor, to begin inoculations in Boston to prevent further spread of the disease. And thus the beginnings of the controversies about inoculation and vaccination began, in America anyway. Inoculation was seeing pretty wide acceptance in Europe by this time, but not so much in the colonies, and people had some pretty mixed opinions about the process. Many people believed that the procedure was more deadly than naturally contracting smallpox, even though evidence said otherwise. Also, the clergy claimed that smallpox was God's punishment for sin and that inoculating yourself against smallpox interfered with God's will. Boston newspapers published arguments for and against inoculation, which polarized Bostonians on the subject even further. The inoculations became so controversial that at one point an angry citizen threw a bomb at Mather's house trying to intimidate both Mather and Boylston from continuing the inoculation process. And unfortunately, all of this doesn't sound that far off from the way that some 21st century Americans react to vaccines. It's also worth noting that the concept of inoculation was introduced to England by Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who had learned of the practice and adopted it for her own children while living in Turkey with her husband, the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. It's interesting that if you consult the history of vaccines, either one or both of these figures, Mary and Onesimus, is usually utterly ignored, with the bulk of credit for the smallpox vaccine being given to Dr. Edward Jenner as the creator of the first successful vaccine. Why? I'm sure it has nothing to do with him being a white man and the other two being black and a woman, respectively. That couldn't be it at all, I'm sure. But back to the 1721 outbreak in Boston. Boylston used math to prove the benefits of the inoculation process, showing that during the epidemic of 1721, the estimated fatality rate of those who naturally contracted smallpox was 14%, while the fatality rate of the inoculated was only 2%. Slowly, Bostonians and other colonists began to accept the benefits of inoculation. During the 1760s, Dr. Joseph Warren operated a smallpox inoculation clinic on Castle Island in Boston Harbor. It was there in 1764 that Dr. Warren would inoculate John Adams against the disease. Dr. Warren would go on to inoculate most of Boston until his death in 1775. Not from smallpox, by the way. He died from a musket ball to the head at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And smallpox would continue to be a major part of the revolution going forward. Another outbreak of the disease in 1775 dramatically impacted General Howe's troops and the citizens of Boston at the time, and a stalemate between Washington and Howe's forces occurred. Washington knew that Continental soldiers would be devastated by the outbreak if it began to spread throughout his soldiers. The stalemate between Washington and Howe continued until March 7, 1776, when General Howe announced to the British Army that they would be evacuating Boston. Washington initially forbid his troops from entering the city even after the British Army had evacuated because of the smallpox epidemic. He knew how dangerous it would be to his troops even then. On March 17th, 10 days after the evacuation, Washington finally permitted 1,000 soldiers who had previously contracted smallpox to enter the city. In 1776, Abigail Adams would inoculate herself and her children against the disease. In a letter to John Adams, Abigail told him about her experience with the inoculation and the mood of Bostonians in regards to inoculation at the time. Such a spirit of inoculation never before took place. The town and every house in it are as full as they can hold. God grant that we may all go comfortably through this distemper. And then in 1777, Washington would mandate the inoculation of all of his troops. Quarantines had proven ineffective to stop the spread of disease among the Continental Army, and Washington wrote that smallpox was more destructive than the sword. In a letter to Dr. William Shippen Jr., director of the medical department of the Continental Army, Washington wrote this. Finding the smallpox to be spreading much and fearing that no precaution can prevent it from running through the whole of our army, I have determined that the troops should be inoculated. This expedient may be attended with some inconveniences and some disadvantages, but yet I trust in its consequences will have the most happy effects. 
Necessity not only authorize, authorizes, but seems to require the measure. For should the disorder infect the army in the natural way and rage within with its usual virulence, we should have more to dread from it than from the sword of the enemy. That said, not everyone followed the orders to inoculate their soldiers. Much like with COVID vaccines today, the distrust of the inoculation process led to several generals and governors prohibiting inoculation, which of course meant that the outbreaks of smallpox still caused shortages of troops anyway, at least at the beginning of the war. Overall, however, the mandate paid off. Fewer than 1% of the soldiers died from being inoculated, and the program was so successful in controlling smallpox outbreaks that George Washington would repeat it at Valley Forge in the winter of 1778. But anti-vaccination rhetoric has been around for as long as inoculation and vaccinations have existed. The first organized anti-vaccine movement began in Britain in the 1850s when the British government made the smallpox vaccine mandatory in 1853. Some opposed the vaccine on the grounds that the government had no business telling people how to take care of their health, ignoring the clear necessity of protecting the population at large. Very libertarian of them. And even in the 1850s, there were naturopaths, those crunchy almond moms who relied on treatments based on plants and water and essential oils. Sorry, Susan, tea tree and eucalyptus oil are not going to cure this one. Anti-vaccination protests swept the United Kingdom with activists waving signs with messages that said, better a felon cell than a poisoned babe, or distributing pamphlets with titles like vaccination, a curse, which... You know, I'm pretty sure I saw those exact same signs and pamphlets at the last Trump rally. History repeats itself with disturbing regularity. People even did the same things to avoid vaccination in the 19th century that we saw people doing with COVID in the 21st. Buying fake vaccination cards, pulling their children out of school or moving to avoid public health officials enforcing the mandate, or trying to suck the vaccine out of their children's arm after it was administered. Every single one of these anti-vaccination moves has been tried in the post-COVID world as well, including people recommending increasingly unhinged ways to detox from the COVID vaccine, like bathing in borax. Please, please do not do that. British anti-vaccine activists then began to send representatives to the United States where cities were beginning to introduce their own vaccine mandates. There, they would help launch a similar movement. In the end, governments began to allow exemptions just to try to calm down the anti-vax movement, and for a time, that worked just fine. The movement collapsed once the mandates became full of exceptions, and trust in medicine and doctors would begin to improve throughout the following decades, hitting the high water mark in the mid-20th century, as medicine found ways to combat many dangerous diseases, not the least of which was Dr. Jonas Salk's vaccine for polio. With polio being as horrifying as it was, there was never really a need for any mandate with this vaccine. Almost every parent was more than happy to risk it all on a relatively untested vaccine, at least when compared to the vaccines of today or even the decades of in-the-field testing that smallpox inoculation had seen. Unfortunately, the enthusiasm for the polio vaccine didn't necessarily translate to enthusiasm for all other vaccines. The measles vaccine, for instance, was not nearly as widely adopted at the same rate, Mostly because measles was something that you could live through and you wouldn't have the life-altering complications of polio. So why bother getting vaccinated for it? Middle-class parents did tend to get it for their children if their family doctor recommended it, but not all the doctors did. Infection rates began to drastically increase in lower-class families compared to middle- and upper-class families as well, and eventually mandates and coercion were the only thing left to get people on board. Health officials began to endorse mandates that required children to be vaccinated to enroll in school. And as it had with the smallpox mandate in the 1800s, these new mandates made some people mad. Now, you won't see me saying, hey, we can always trust the government and doctors 100%, because A, the Tuskegee experiment, enough said, and B, I've had too many doctors insist that all my symptoms might be because I'm pregnant, even after I've told them that I'm a lesbian, or that I need to lose weight, and that'll clear everything right up. Doctors aren't always trustworthy, and neither are the government, and they don't always have our best interests at heart, but as far as vaccines are concerned, they can pump me full of them. Give me all the vaccines. You know why? Because being sick sucks, and I don't want to be the reason that COVID or any other disease kills someone else. But if you're the kind of person that thinks the COVID vaccine will make you sterile and possibly turn you into a crocodile, then my words are largely lost on you. If, however, you are still listening, 
Enjoy the second half of the episode in which I speak with journalist David Heath about his book, Long Shot, the inside story of the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. All right, so today's episode, we have David Heath as a special guest to talk with us about his book, Long Shot, the inside story of the race for a COVID-19 vaccine, which was published just very recently in 2022. Uh, I feel incredibly honored that he's even considering popping onto my little show, much less actually agreeing to do it. Uh, look, I'm very proud of bitchy history, don't get me wrong, uh, but it's objectively not the biggest name show that an award-winning investigative journalist could be coming on to talk about his book. Uh, so I am very pleased to have David here. Uh, he's even been featured in Net a Netflix documentary series, Dirty Money. So I mean, I feel like this is really upping my street cred as a, as a podcaster having you here. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, David. Uh, well, you've done a good job yourself. I mean, I'm a longtime journalist. I've, I did mostly investigative reporting, and I've worked at places that people would know would be like CNN and USA Today. But then I w was working on a story at USA Today about um, as the vaccine was being created, I um, managed to get hold of the scientists who actually did the the, had the scientific breakthroughs that led to the vaccines and to interviewed them as the vaccine was being created so sort of in real time it's a fascinating book i i will admit i have not finished all of it because my reading list is so so thick but i've done the typical ap academic thing of i've read the entire introduction the entire epilogue and then i've read little bits in between uh which i'm really looking forward to reading the rest of it because uh -huh. You're fascinated. You're a great writer uh is one thing like it, it's a topic that doesn't really feel like it should be super interesting or engaging but you've made it really en engaging so uh you know yeah. i'm not i'm not a science person so i uh, you know it, you've made it easy to understand too so i do really highly recommend it you've worked a lot on stories I've, i was noticing looking up your your past you know past reporting and things like that when getting ready for this interview uh you've done a lot of stuff dealing with the medical field and with drug research and things like that in the past uh, what what kind of drew you into doing that kind of investigative journalism and and what inspired you to write long shot really? Um, yes, yeah, so I've been you're right. I've been doing probably healthcare related investigations going all the way back maybe 20 years. I had a huge uh, series with another reporter named Duff Wilson where we looked at um, some serious problems with a clinical trial at a cancer center where, everybody died. And uh, so I've been doing this a long time. And, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, <clears throat> I was uh, working on basically the, you know, the COVID-19. And somebody came up with the idea, it wasn't me actually, that we try to get a narrative account of how they're going to create the vaccine. At the time, we thought it was unlikely, you know, we sort of assumed, not knowing what we were talking about, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I was just thinking um, vaccines are supposed to take 10 years to make. And at uh, so, yeah, at least. And so I want to know, is it really possible that we're going to have a vaccine in a year? So I started reaching out to all these scientists who were really the brains behind the vaccine. And in fact, they had been working on this vaccine for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it sort of fit the, 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 um, the history of vaccines. Uh, it was just a lucky, it was really lucky that um, that this particular virus was the one that turned into a pandemic. Right. And I know that they had been talking about, like, it, this is COVID is related to like the SARS. It, it's it's part of the SARS epidemic. We've seen a lot of SARS epidemics, uh, you know, in the last 20 or so years, even further back around the world. We just hadn't seen a worldwide pandemic. And I know that there ha that had been a, a discussion of if, you know, if we're going to get a world pan worldwide pandemic, what is going to be the disease that hits? And SARS was high up on the list of, of possibilities, uh, definitely. And so it helped a lot that we we had people behind the scenes, the people that don't get their names mentioned very often, the people who are pretty much OK uh, with with being behind the scenes and, and just doing their work. Um, they'd already they'd already thought this through and they were they were doing the research that needed to be done, which is I said remarkably, uh, remarkably timely. It was just very, very much luck, basically, as you said. Right. The the key scientist was really a guy named Barney Graham, and he was at the National Institutes of Health working under Anthony Fauci. 
And um, he was really looking for, he had spent his entire life looking for a vaccine for RSV, which by the way, you, is now on the market. His vaccine, the vaccine that he created just came on the market and you can get uh, you know, inoculated for RSV now. Um, so in doing that research, and then also in doing research, his he works at the, a place in Bethesda, Maryland called um, the Vaccine Research Center. And it was set up by Clinton to find a vaccine for HIV. And they haven't managed to do that yet. That was its only purpose. But in doing in doing that research, HIV is such a difficult virus to uh, create a vaccine for that they really that there was a lot of advancements in science. So there were all these things happening. And then separately, there were a group of scientists at the University of Pennsylvania who were playing around with uh, mRNA and figured out uh, how to make mRNA actually work because many people had tried it and it kept failing. And so a couple of scientists, Drew Wiseman and Caitlin Carrico at the University of Pennsylvania uh, came up with a solution. And uh, all of this happened sort of all at the same time and Barney Graham was the person who put all the pieces together and said, okay, we're going to use these HIV advancements that we've learned, and we're going to use mRNA, and we're going to make a vaccine. And he made the Moderna vaccine. That's the one. I think that's the one I got. Yeah, the Moderna vaccine is the one I got. Uh, yeah, and I got all the vaccines. I was like, you want to give it to me? Stick it in my arm. I'm good. Thank you. I will, I will have to take it. Uh, I don't understand people. Like I know you talk a lot about in this, uh, in the book about people's distrust of the vaccine and, and things like that, that have been going on. I just, I don't get it. I, I guess maybe I was raised by a generation that wind up to just take polio vaccines without having any, you know, knowledge of what was in them or any knowledge of how they'd been developed just because, Hey, better to have it than not right um and so very much grew up in a family that trusted trusted science <laughs> right well when you think about it what people did to avoid smallpox you know back in the early days before it was really even a vaccine it was yeah. it was a different process and the risk they took uh that may have saved their lives and then later on with polio with the polio vaccine um the polio vaccine is not as safe as the covid 19 vaccines um, and when it first came out, there were some serious problems with it. There was some contaminated doses. Uh, so people ended up getting polio from the vaccine. Um, and you can still today get polio. It's very rare, but you can still get polio from the polio vaccine. And um, so, but everybody accepted it. And everybody accepted it. And as a result, polio is almost wiped out on the planet. I mean, it's it still exists. It came back to the United States not too long ago, um, and that, that actually came back because somebody got polio from a vaccine and then spread it. So, um, but it's almost wiped out. But you're right. The 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 the, the um, anti-vax movement had just took off with COVID nineteen. I don't fully understand why. Yeah, the anti-vax movement, I've before I, I went back into history, uh, I was working in politics. And so I had a lot of, you know, I, I dealt with some health policy stuff, education policy, things like that. And so there always was this kind of small anti-vax movement in America of, you know, kind of the, the crunchy moms, the the that don't want to get their they want their kids to be raised natural, all of that stuff. Uh, but those those were extremely far left wing kind of people, generally speaking. So this was a very interesting change where you ended up with this a, a very right wing element who became anti-vax during this period of time as well. Uh, you mentioned in the book that there had been a definite shift in how the public trusts science, the vaccines. You, you referenced the measles vaccine specifically at one point, um, the, you know, trust of it and things like that. Why, why do you think there is this this shift in trusting the science and trusting vaccines? You know, I think that you, you're right. It kind of started off as a left wing thing. It was sort of like, don't put that in my body kind of thing. And, um, and then I think during COVID, but before COVID, and I don't know the full history, but I know during COVID, there was this attitude that COVID-19 was not a real virus. It was not, it was like the flu. We, we, we overreacted to it. And there was sort of this anti-COVID-19 attitude that somehow got extended to the vaccines. For whatever reason, it didn't get extended to things like ivermectin, which, you know, doesn't work. But people started 
embracing drugs that were useless. At the same time, they were rejecting these vaccines, which had actually are the most effective, most powerful vaccines we've ever created. I mean, the 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 science that went into them um, is truly remarkable. And, uh, you know, it's like probably the achievement so far of this century, creating those vaccines. And yet people even now today, I know you keep, ha- I just got a booster the other day, keep having to get boosters. And so that has probably taken some of the, um, I don't know, some of the allure off even the people who are pro-vaccine. It's that the vaccines don't last very long which is there's, I, I don't know if there's, they'll ever figure out a way to get around that. They probably won't. And you know, when I think about it, I just think about the fact that I get a, a new flu shot every year. I don't, I don't judge the booster for needing a booster or needing something for a new variant, because that's just the way that, that's just the way that science works. That's the way viruses mutate. It, it I would think that's common knowledge, but I've realized in the last few years when I finally started teaching history that things I think are common knowledge are, are not. So uh, like I, I understand that viruses mutate. That's a thing that happens. And I, I don't judge science for not being able to give me a perfect vaccine. But a lot of people, people do think it should be infallible, I guess, and, and not have any, you know, have any problems. The first results we got, the first vaccine was so effective. It was like 95% effective. And it, you didn't even, if you got the vaccine, you or were unlikely to even get COVID, period. I mean, breakthrough cases were very rare. That sort of changed over time with new variants. And so the vaccine was actually so effective initially that now everybody holds it to the standard and saying, well, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. Well, you know, the flu shot may, some years may only be 40% effective. You right. Know, but nobody, nobody's going out there saying, oh, well, this is like poison. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get the flu every year. I just realized that because I got the flu shot, my flu symptoms are not going to be as bad. I'm not going to be in as in, you know, I'm not going to be sick as long. Like, fine. I, I don't mind if I get the flu every year when I get the flu vaccine, just because I know it's going to, it is going to help me. It's going to make it a little bit less, less bad. And I've gotten, I have gotten COVID. I've kept up with all my boosters and everything like that. But when the Delta variant came out, when the Omicron variant came out and started, started spreading, I did end up getting it. Um, because I was, you know, working in fields where I was packed in with a lot of people and a lot of them who didn't trust vaccines, uh, to be honest. So herd immunity just wasn't going to cover me uh, at that point, even with with my vaccine. Uh, but I never ended up in the hospital. I never ended up, you know, uh, on a on any sort of breathing machine or anything like that. And I'm I'm happy with that. That's that's good. That's all. I, that's all I really need out of it. <laughs> What's another interesting thing that. It- Hardly anyone seems to know is that a lot of the technology that with vaccines has gone into treatments as well and diagnostics. So you have like a range of uh, ways to treat COVID now, including Paxlovid um, and things like that. And and a lot of the success that we've had in treating it also kind of goes back to the science behind the vaccines. It's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You, I, you, in part of the book, you mentioned that so much of the credit on this has gone to like Operation Warp Drive. It's, it's gone to the, that idea, and I, I almost think that in a way that is one of the reasons why people mistrust it so much because we put so much emphasis on the rapid creation of the vaccine without advertising the fact that this is based on literal decades of research and work by so many by so many dedicated scientists on this and i i wonder if maybe if we had changed the narrative flipped the narrative a little bit more to basically the narrative that you've covered in your book um if maybe that people might have trusted it a little bit more possibly you know i think that the, so going back to barney graham um mm-hmm. the whole time so i was interviewing him in real time you know as things were happening and he I think everybody, I thought, he thought that this was all going to be settled once the vaccine, if the vaccine came out and it was successful, they thought, well, we'll we've conquered COVID-19. And he he even broke down and cried when he heard the first results. And I think what he, the last time I interviewed him, the, the thing that he didn't anticipate was how many people were going to reject the vaccine because they didn't trust it. And I think that that is, um, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way. So as somebody who kind of interacted with these scientists for months and and was essentially was rooting for them, you know, I wanted this vaccine to work too. I wanted us to get out of this pandemic. I think also the other thing is that 
it is true that I got COVID, but I think that because I've been back, I've had probably six shots now. And I don't, I no longer like think that there's a chance that I'm going to die from COVID. Whereas, you know, that was a real likelihood before the vaccines came out. So, so for those who do believe in science and those who do believe in vaccines, the vaccines, even though they wane a little bit over time and so you can get sick, you might end up in the hospital, you're still more, you're still going to do better. Just like you said, with the, the like, just like with the flu shot, you're going to do a lot better if you've been vaccinated. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important. And I, it is so nice to like see the stories of these scientists who worked on it to to hear what they thought about it uh because i think a lot of people do sometimes think that scientists are kind of like cold fish right dead fish they don't really they don't really react to things and to hear like that he cried when hearing the you know the results of the first vaccine or to, you know how much they care about people and how much they care about about saving lives, even if they're not going to get any recognition or, or or major attention from it, is it, it's incredibly just nice to see. Like, I, I think it make, gives a bit more for human face to the entire process of science. It's true. I mean, this, uh, Barney is a very genuine. I mean, he 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 really does. He's he's a very good person. And when people talk about the vaccines as though they were created to make money. It's like, well, they weren't created by you know, a pharmaceutical company. They were created by government and academic scientists. And then pharmaceutical companies managed, you know, sold them. So, but the people who actually, but I actually know, I know all the people who were behind making the vaccines. And, you know, it kind of hurts me a little bit when I hear people act as though this is all about, you know, greed and, um, you know, just making a ton of money because Barney Graham didn't make a lot of money out of the vaccine. Exactly. Or, or thinking that it's about microchipping people and turning us into 5G towers. I, I'm still mad that I wasn't turned into a 5G tower, to be honest. I feel like that was, I was, I got some bad, you know, bad advertisement there. I, I feel like I, I got, I got screwed on that because I would love to be my own walking 5G tower. That was kind of one of my main goals for getting the vaccine, honestly. Yeah, well, maybe, really. maybe next time we have a pandemic, they'll get to that. They'll figure right. that out. <laughs> we'll get we'll get the microchip. Like, do you understand how small needles are and how big microchips are? That you can't inject somebody with a microchip. That's not a that's not a logical thing at all. Uh, not with that kind of needle, anyway. Um, so you said that you went into this researching it, not really knowing much about the background of the vaccine, right? You you kind of you know you were going into this under the impression that this was kind of a they were starting from a dead stop uh, on this research and things like that. Uh, so what was one of the most interesting things that you kind of discovered, like a jaw dropping moment of information for you while you were, while you were working on long shot? So the very first interview I had that, that turned everything around was I did reach Barney Graham and I was surprised he was willing to talk to me because I mean, it was at the heart. We were, we were in this pandemic. He was working night and day to, you know, to, to solve it. And he's, you know, and I talked to him many times and he, um, he told me the very first thing he said to me was we've been working on this vaccine for a decade. And the reason that they'd been working on it for a decade was because um, it, that's a long story. And I'll tell you the very short version, which is um, after they had, had created the, they figured out how to make an RSV vaccine. It took them, you know, 10 or 15 years to get from figuring out how to do the RSV vaccine to getting it on the market when it's on the market right now. Um, and so everything he learned from that, he decided, okay, well, let's use this on another virus. And at that very moment, there was a, and it still exists, by the way, there was a pandemic, there was not a pandemic, but there was a um, outbreak of something called MERS, which is another form of, which is another version of the coronavirus. And so they decided, well, let's try making a vaccine for that. And the reason they did it had nothing to do so much with, um, well, they knew that there was going to be another coronavirus vac uh, and, uh, outbreak, and there was. Um, but they also thought it was a very, it was a virus that was not many people had studied. So there was a lot of sort of opportunity for them to learn a lot from looking at it. So basically, to, and to make the story short, They've created essentially a MERS vaccine, 
uh, within about three or four years. And then when the uh, COVID-19 came out and broke out uh, in China in 2019, um, all they had to do essentially was tweak it. They just had to tweak it based on the composition of what's called the spike protein. So they were defeating the spike protein. They already knew how to do that because they did it with a different uh, coronavirus. So they literally created the, the vaccine in about an hour or two. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I can see why that would be jaw dropping information to find out that it was it was, you know, I said it's not just luck, it's good timing and also just consistent, consistent effort over the course of decades of research where, you know, scientists have been putting in the effort, knowing that something like this was going to come and 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 doing what they could to prepare us for it, essentially. Um, and that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it is amazing. There's a lot of there's a lot of viruses that we could have. There are other viruses that we could have had a pandemic with, and um, we kind of got lucky because um, MERS has a 35 percent fatality rate, Whew. but it's not very, and it still exists by the way. It's still out there, um, but it's not very contagious. Mm -hmm. um, COVID nineteen is really contagious but it has a relatively low fatality rate, even compared to SARS-1. And so we really lucked out that we had this terrible infectious disease that could have wiped out a lot of the population. It, it did kill millions of people, mm -hmm. um, but it could have been so much worse. And um, you know, that's just the luck of the draw. It is, definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming on to talk about the book. Uh, it, uh, the book is super, super good. I really I recommend it to all of my listeners. Definitely take a look at it. It's called Long Shot, The Inside Story of the Race for a COVID-19 Vaccine. I will put a link up to it on the website so you'll be able to, to access it uh, and buy a copy of it. I'm going to finish reading it probably in the next couple of weeks and then pass it on, pass my copy on to my mom. Cause she's very interested in this. She's in the medical field as well. So, uh, yeah, so it was fascinating, really great to talk with you. And I'm so grateful for you coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. And is there anywhere online that you could recommend people to find you, uh, to follow you, things like that? Yeah, so I'm on all the social media, but like I have a website where you can find everything. It's at www.david-heath.com. Okay, great. And I will also put a link to that in the episode description for uh, for this when the episode goes up. So you guys should be able to find it. No problem. Uh, and thank you guys so much for tuning in to hear about the history of vaccines this week. And I'll see you back here next Monday. And that's it for today. Thank you so much to David once again for coming on the show. I highly recommend his book. I literally read the rest of it the night after I interviewed him and finished it in one sitting. To close out the show, I'd like for everyone to know that I'm working on some online courses. I may end up doing my whole American History 101 run through as an online course, but I haven't really decided on that yet. But I am putting together a series on TikTok for October, which will give you a rundown on the history of the witch trials in a far more in-depth way than the podcast episode on it did earlier this summer. I'm also putting together a course using music to teach the Cold War, and for any listeners with teenagers, I'm now putting together classes for a secular homeschool group called OutSchool. The course I offer at the moment is titled Shattering Glass Ceilings, A Journey Through Women's History in the USA, and a link to it will be posted on bitchyhistory.com for those of you interested in signing up your teenagers for it. The other courses, like the Music and the Cold War course, aren't ready to launch yet, but links will be posted and I'll announce them on the show when they are ready. Thank you so much for coming to listen to me bitch about history, and I hope that you'll all continue to do so, even with the slightly new direction of the show. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about my personal history passions more than being constrained by keeping a chronological order to my content. To that end, I will be jumping forward in time a lot in our next episode, and we'll be talking about a topic that's gotten me into no end of trouble on social media and HR in one memorable occasion, the American Civil War. So tune in for that next week.